glad there was so much interest at the end there in uh, in geosynthetics and geotubes. Uh, they're becoming you know more and more really critical technology um, for use in a, in a lot of these applications. And um, it, it just so happens that one of our sponsors for the event, uh, Tenkata, uh, is probably the premier global you know manufacturer of geosynthetics and uh, particular geotubes. And I think he's here to tell us a little bit more about you know, what they can do. First of all, I'm delighted that there's so many people that know about YouTube already. I was, uh, so that's good. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me to talk about uh, the products that we make um, and to uh, show you how this technology can be used for the beneficial reuse of fresh materials. First of all, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the company, Tenkata, and then about our specific product, the Geotube, and then lastly, I'm going to show you some case studies where it's being used for beneficial reuse of dredged materials. I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but I just want to point out that, whoops, um, that we are, we started over 300 years ago. Uh, we have been weaving textiles all those years, and now we are in, in some very specialized areas. We have the designation of a royal company. That's a designation given to a certain number of uh, Dutch companies by the monarchy in uh, the Netherlands. So we are the world market leaders in protective fabrics. We make uh, products for firefighters, for our military. We are the world market leader in advanced armor that's used to protect our, our military personnel. We are a worldwide top two in aerospace composites. We are the world market leader in spacecraft composites. And we are the world market leader in geosynthetics and industrial fabrics, and that's where uh, our group falls. So we're a big company. Uh, you may not be that familiar. We are obviously a Dutch company, but uh, we have operations in the United States that uh, provide all these products for the Americas. Um, Tankata invented geotextile tubes over 50 years ago, about 50 years this year. The first tube unit was installed. Uh, since then, hundreds of miles of shoreline have been protected, and we've contained millions of cubic yards of dredged material. Geotube units were first tested for dike reconstruction and shoreline protection. And for that application, we have a, a particular product. I brought a couple samples if you want to see the products we use for um, our shoreline protection and also for eroding or for dewatering. Uh, the technology has restored dozens of wetland habitats. We've saved millions of dollars of valuable property. And it is installed worldwide in over 70 countries. We manufacture in the Netherlands, in the US, and in China. Tankata partnered with the Corps of Engineers when the technology first came to the United States and, uh, to develop an advanced marine technology that eventually evolved into dewatering applications in the mid-90s. So how does this work? Well, there's two markets, as I mentioned. There are marine structures, and then there is the dewatering market. Marine structures, um, in the initial filling stage, that involves the geotube containers being filled with dredged sand or similar materials. Then there's the containment stage. The fabric allows the dredged materials to fall out of suspension and to form a dense monolithic structure within the tube. And in the final structural stage, the contained and densified material serves as a structural mass. In the watery, conditioned slurry, and I, I will stress the condition um, and your scope of this, but the, the slurry is conditioned with flocculants to pull all the suspended solids together and, and drop it out of suspension. So that conditioned slurry is pumped into the geotube unit. Clean filtrate is flowing from the units, allowing the solids to consolidate and the dewatered cake solids are then ready for either removal or for capping. So how does this technology give sludge a function? Well, if it's non-contaminated, it can be used for agricultural spreading, it can be used for shaping the landscape by insertion of the tubes below the surface, as you saw in the Netherlands, reinforcement of a dike, and also to create uh, containment structures for CDF for dredged materials. With contaminated sediments, you also saw the restoring of a port, entrance to a port, 
And I'm going to show you some case studies on creating public park space and creating a foundation for a new port facility. Um, this is with non-contaminated dredge sediments. It's a project in um, Illinois. The DNR here designed and constructed 27-acre island using 6,000 lint feet of huge containers for containment of 2,000 yards of dredge materials. The island was designed to protect the eroding shoreline and to provide habitat for the wildlife and native vegetation. As the geotrip containers are placed, the island is being created by filling inside the perimeter with the organic deposits and silt. An additional dredge material was pumped inside the geotrip containment area to create a wildlife habitat. With uh, the contaminated sediments, I'm going to show you a couple of case studies. Uh, these have both happen to be in Brazil. Canal de Fandau is one of the most contaminated estuaries in all of Brazil and is located on the northwest shore of Guanabara Bay near Rio de Janeiro. This was created, this island was, uh, was created uh, when Petrobras, the national oil company, used the dredge spoils from Guanabara Bay to uh, build uh, Fandau Island in 1951. After more than 10 years of study, the project was funded to dredge and remove 2 million cubic meters of contaminated sediments from the Canal de Fundau to improve the tidal flow and to restore the estuary to its natural environment. Tenkata geotube dewatering technology was chosen as the most economical methodology to dewater, reduce the volume, and contain the contaminated sediments. Two totally contained areas dewatering cells were constructed on Fundau Island for this purpose. A total of 16,500 lin meters of, these are 120 feet in circumference, uh, geotube units were filled. The contaminated sediments were pumped to the cells through a 12 inch uh, dredge discharge line where the polymer was injected. And you see, you see along here, there is a manifold system and off that manifold, uh, come the, the pipes that fill each individual tube. Three layers of these large circumference tubes were stacked in each dewatering cell, cell and pumped to a fill height of about 2.2 meters or about seven feet, a little over seven feet. And after allowing six months to complete the dewatering process, a one meter thick layer of clay was compacted to form an impermeable cover over the geotube units in both dewatering cells. And now the two dewatering cells have been landscaped to form a park, a natural area, bike and jogging trails, and soccer fields, providing beneficial use for the residents of Rio de Janeiro. The next project is uh, called the Ember Port Project. This is a new port facility. The channel leading to the Ember Port facility within the harbor of Santo Sao Paulo, Brazil, contains a half a million cubic meters of contaminated sediments that's being dredged and dewatered in one layer of 120 foot circumference by 235 foot long tubes, which is being used to form a major portion of the fill material over the container over which the container yard will be built. Dubai Ports International together with uh, Odebrecht are the owners. So to begin with, to start the project, um, an impervious dike was built surrounding the geotube, where the geotube units would be laid, creating a watertight basin. Then a drainage blanket was put in place, and then wick drains were put in place down to the design depth to help consolidate the material. On top of the drainage blanket, the geotubes were placed. There's an overlap to, to get a very tight seal between units, adjacent units. And this just shows you the uh, conceptual drawing of this design with the, the um, berm and drainage blanket, weak drains, and geotube. The geotube containers <coughs> were filled to a height of eight feet, allowed to consolidate to approximately seven. And then the fill and the overfill was placed to a height to achieve an overburden of six tons per square meter surcharge. So this is placement of the fill and then after consolidation of the material. After consolidation, uh, the overfill and part of the 78 centimeters below 
the pavement elevation will be removed section. And then they'll build the pavement and the presence of two layers of geotextile, high strength geotextiles is designed to improve the behavior of the pavement by providing low distribution and minimizing the differential settlement. So this is the uh, project at the uh, start. There's two areas, large areas for dewatering the tubes. This just shows you the uh, cell number one with uh, the tubes laid out. Here we see another going further. You can see cell number two in the background. And this was taken last month in aerial view. And now what you see here is uh, this is cell one. The surcharge has been placed. Cell two is still being filled. They have 60 more days of uh, filling. In the foreground, you see the, the uh, pond where all the filtrate is collected. And from there, it goes to three uh, ponds for treatment before discharge back into the bay. In the foreground, you see the uh, three dredges that are driving piles. And over here, the concrete beams and deck is being placed. And all this precast of material is being created right here on the island. And this just shows you the, uh, the surcharge on the cell one. And these are the two still in uh, being filled. Again, the surcharge, this will be moved over to cell two when they're done dredging. And this, this illustrates the, uh, the initial area where, the, where this uh, new port was designed. And this is the artist's rendering of the final project as is this. And that's it. Thank you. So, uh, Rob, I know you've got a yeah. question you want to kick things off. So, uh, one of the things that has, or one of the reasons that we've been fascinated with geotubes is because we see them as kind of uh, symptomatic of this larger shift. Um, and sort of the design of marine and littoral environments from hard infrastructures to softer infrastructures. Um, and kind of traditionally, particularly um, in North America and the United States, um, I'm just not speaking for the rest of the world, um, the hard infrastructure of the 20th century had kind of um, this public perception of it as heroic and monumental. Um, and, and so in that way, uh, it was kind of necessary things were transformed into these sort of um, valorous or um, publicly uh, publicly appreciated things. So like thinking of the Hoover Dam, for instance, as kind of this symbol of America's infrastructural ingenuity. Um, I'm wondering if um, it's soft infrastructures, um, if public perception, perception of them is maybe quite different, particularly in the case of geotubes. Um, and if so, um, what kind of barriers to the, their implementation does that present? Or do you see public perception of them changing? Or I don't know. Uh, I have to think about the public perception. Um, so many of these structures are, are not on view. So um, <laughs> The you know beach restoration or um, shoreline protection is a good example where the tubes may be used as the core of a, um, a dune. Uh, they're covered with sands so they're not seen. Um, they they reduce the amount of rock that has to be brought in. So from a carbon footprint, they're you know, very um, illogical. <laughs> That's the right way to say it. Um, the uh, you know like where they uh, where they are exposed in some marine environments, uh, breakwaters, um, they are covered with marine algae very quickly, so they're not visible. Uh, I don't know if I'm answering your question or not, but um, you know, I'm not. Uh, am I? Uh, they're invisible. Is what you're yeah, I mean, you're saying that uh, at least sometimes there may be no public perception of them because they're invisible. They're not really. Uh, they're they're not exposed. exposed. Some um, from a dewatering standpoint, if they're to be used and left in place, uh, they're, 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 two things happen after they're de after dewatering. Uh, either the material is removed and placed in a, in a different location, or they're left in place and they're uh, covered with usually the native soils and create a, another uh, a park or something on that order, like you see. 
So again, uh, during the construction phase, you probably will you know, see them, but beyond that, <coughs> they're gone. Yes? Uh, two questions. One, just about actually the form of these tubes and whether you can make mini tubes for certain applications, is there, or larger giant tubes for yeah. other, and, and then, and why the tube? Could they be, if you, I mean, are there other shapes, as it were, that could be generated? And then secondly, about um, embedding uh, intelligence into the textiles in certain ways, so sensors and things like that, and, and whether that's something that you guys are working on. Yeah, um, the first question um, about the shape. The, the geotube units come in all different sizes. They come in very small units, and, um, and they come in these gigantic units. The ones you saw in Brazil are the largest that we are making right now. Okay. Um, for marine structures, the circumference is not as large because the weight of the material is heavier. So those, the circumference on those will be smaller. Um, we, my rep sitting in the back, Peter Kay, has come up with uh, a, a unique application for one of his industrial customers. And we're fabricating these, not a tube, but it looks like a room, a small room, to, to fit into their uh, industrial uh, site. So we can do some interesting fabrications. Um, and then the latter part of your question was? In sensors. Sensors. Um, interestingly, we have a new product in, in Tenkata called GeoDetect, where we are embedding fiber optics into textiles and combining the benefits of these two together. We haven't done it into the tube yet, uh, not to say that it couldn't happen in the future, but um, that, that material is being used in soil structures to measure stress and temperature and give a, a warning system, if you will, you know, that of micro erosion or something in a levee or a dam. I think you had a question, then we'll go to Bill afterwards. Well, I guess um, related to this idea of this being invisible, and I think it's sort of been a, a theme in a lot of the conversations that we're having about dredging being something that is bringing up very common materials that is a revealing process that's creating a between large mass materials. Um, I think it would be interesting to know if there is a potential for these geotubes to create amazing forms that maybe expose the process and expose um, the history of, of the thing that they're containing. And I'm curious if, if they have a structure that can be less invisible, that doesn't have to be below a meter of clay or could be planted in an interesting way or could be formed into a ski slope or a pyramid or some other forms that aren't just in their own. I don't know. Um, <laughs> it's interesting. Um, there, are, there are some limitations, I think, in the way you stack them, you know, that, that they will kind of have a, a mound shape, if you will. Um, we're going to, we're looking at a project where we're going to, you know, we can bench them into an embankment, an existing embankment. In this case, it's in a mine site um, where there's an, an old high wall, and they just want that vertical wall to stay there, and then the tubes will be, you know, laid and placed and benched back. Uh, you know, as far as the, having them exposed, um, they, they do have UV inhibitors in the, in the textile. But we have to be cognizant of the long-term stability of the fabric if it's exposed, and that would depend on the part of the world, you know, the intensity of the light. Um, so, you know, so in some applications we put a shroud over them or some other protective cover. I guess you could always do that. You could, you could put vegetation, um, you know, like a, a, even an artificial vegetated mat or you know, core mats. Now, there's certainly ways, I guess, that you can make them more attractive. <laughs> I think you just answered the question. The before it was stated that they have a 100-year lifetime. You apparently have 50 years experience. Um, you have 100% 50-year, everything's great, or you have had some problems? Um, it, 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 you know, they're exposed. You know, what Edgar was talking about, they're embedded in the soil. They're not exposed to the light. And polypropylene is inert material. It's not, it, it's very, um, compatible with a wide range of pH from like 2 to 12. I mean, if there's very aggressive material in the in the tube, we would do testing, compatibility testing with the fabric to see if it would 
affected, where the uh, the life of the product yeah. would be, you know, certainly less than that. In the marine environment, as an example, where let's say it's used uh, um, as a wave break, you know, where there's there's constant pounding, there might be marine debris that would hit it. That that could be something that could hit, uh, that damage the fabric. Um, in certain, if it's if it's exposed in certain parts of the world, you know that we have very very intense life. Uh, it, it's going to have short life. Then. How how does the cost of a project like the one you were showing up there using geotubes compare to the cost using more traditional? Well, the, what we compete with uh, is mechanical dredging, um, plate frame presses, centrifuges in some cases to dewater the material. Um, the advantage is that this technology has, you have to have space available, you can see for these, you know, to, to deploy a large a number of tubes. So you have the, the capacity of tubes out there so that these dredging operations can pump, you know, 6,000 gallons a minute to those tubes, and they do. Um, but in, we've seen examples of about 30% cost, less cost, uh, just from the standpoint of uh, material and and, um, and and operations, and with mechanical dredge, or dewatering processes, at least at least a third less. Okay, question for the um, the marine structures application of the dewatering um, cost savings in there relative to more traditional ways of constructing, you know, a, a pier or, or uh, you know beach protection, whatever it might be. Are you seeing the um, the savings come more from the speed with which your tubes can be deployed, or is it from just a material difference, construction costs, or what? It would be primarily material difference. If particularly, there's a there's an advantage if, if it's just uh, if sand is not readily available. We're finding in a lot of a lot of locations. Uh, we did a big project down at Wallops Island uh, for NASA. They have a, a launch facility on Wallops Island, and uh, they. Even in that one, and that was about a mile of uh, geotube, the, the first phase, uh, they had to import the sand, even though they were right on uh, the water, and they couldn't dredge it out of the, the surf. So if, if it's expensive to import the sand, um, you have a savings you know, by encapsulating it in, in the tube. And, and the other would be rock. I mean, if you have to pull the green rock in, this is much less expensive. And, and then the other thing is, let's say it's a dune protection. If, if uh, it's protecting the core of the dune, so what we've seen, we've had an installation in Atlantic City for a long time since the mid early 90s. And when nor'easters come in or hurricanes in, in some of the Gulf states, um, and they take out, you know, that they erode the beach, but they still, you still have that core protecting the property behind it, so it's not taking out the entire dune. Got, and then it has to be recovered. Yeah, you have to put more, yeah, re-nourish the beach with more sand. Did I answer that? Yeah, yeah, thanks. All right, thank you.